Great. So thank you very much for being here and watching this live or in the video recording afterwards. So I'm Emil Bjornsson and I will talk today about evolving mobile broadband connectivity towards 60. So what will be the, the idea with my talk? Well, I would like to talk about what is cellular communications uh, and what has happened in the past, in which ways have it been evolved over time? And then in which way is 5G changing cellular technology? What was the vision for it? What is the reality today? And what might be the reality in the future? And what does this tell us about what it will turn into in the future? So I will talk about 6G visions and some new enabling technologies that can achieve part of those visions. And uh, why am I giving this talk? Well, I've moved as a visiting professor to KTH uh, last year. And in particular, I was recently appointed the Digital Futures Fellowship for this next year. So I will just uh, dive right into it and provide it with an introduction to what is cellular communications. So wireless communication in a nutshell is this kind of concept of sending something from one place to another uh, from the base station here to a mobile phone, for example. And what are we then sending? Well, we would like to send a sequence of bits, for example, zeros and ones. And every time we are communicating, we are dividing our sequence of zeros and one into small segments that we are transmitting over there, mapping on different radio waves at the center there. So this is what I've tried to illustrate here. Every time I'm transmitting zero, zero, I send this uh, red wave here. It's actually not colored, but it has a particular shape that is saying this shape tells me that it's zero, zero that I'm transmitting. One zero have another shape, one one have a third shape, zero one have a fourth shape. And next time I send one one, I use the same shape again. And I repeat like that. So this is essentially how wireless communication works. You are taking a sequence of zeros and ones describing some kind of information, it could be anything. You chop it up into small pieces, you transmit them one at a time mapped at some kind of radio wave that goes over there. The challenge is that you're not receiving something that looks nice like this. There's no colors. And in addition to having a signal that might ideally look like this when it leaves the transmitter, when it reaches the receiver, there is also a lot of noise and maybe also interference from other systems that are adding on top of it. So the challenge really in wireless is to design communication algorithms that allows us to take a signal that looks like this and map it back to the original sequence with zeros and ones. And you can then imagine that the more options we're having, here we have four different options. If we try to have more of them, then it will be harder to tell them apart when we add noise on top of them. And each sequence here have a particular time length. And this comes from the sampling theorem, which is telling us that uh, you can transmit the same number of complex valued samples per second as you have bandwidth. And therefore the period of one transmission here is one divided by the bandwidth. So how many bits can we transmit reliably here? I mean, here I was illustrating a case where you have four different options. Should we have six? Should we have eight? Should we have two? Uh, well, there is something called a channel capacity that is telling us how many we should choose per simple period in order to be able to transmit as much information as possible in a reliable way, meaning that we can decode it in a good way when it has reached receiver, if we are transmitting a lot of data, which is typically the case in broadband scenarios. And the formula, I will come back to this one later and enrich it, but essentially the bandwidth, which was then the number of symbols that we have per second, multiplied with a logarithm of base two, because this has to do with bits. And then it's one plus the signal power that is reaching the receiver divided by the interference plus the noise power. So the things that are added on top of it. So this is telling us how many bits per second we can transmit. And uh, cellular networks is what we are mainly utilizing uh, today when it comes to getting wide area coverage. All our mobile phones are connecting to these type of networks. And, and this idea of wireless networks based on the cellular idea of dividing the world into different areas putting a base station on rooftops or on towers at certain locations. This goes all the way down to the 50s and 60s. 
So people of Bell Labs in the US were at already that time thinking about, oh, we are delivering fixed telephone services. How can we do it wirelessly? Well, we will have to have a different base station at different locations so that we can serve an entire city with many customers. So we can divide the city into regions and reuse the same kind of frequencies at multiple times. And what we have seen then is that even if the idea of cellular networks were appearing already in the 60s, then the first actual commercial deployment happened in the early 80s. So during the 80s, we had what we call the first generation, uh, which were analog phones, particularly car phones. So it was too heavy to really go around and put in your, uh, in your pocket. Then in 1990s, I think that was when cellular networks became more of an every person's uh, thing. So that was also when we changed digital phones and it started to be small enough devices so that people could afford them and utilize them all the time. In 2001, we can see here there's like 10 times, uh, 10 years in between each of these generations. So 3G appeared at that time. And the new thing was then that now we could also use the internet. So we were not only transmitting mainly text messages and phone calls, but also wireless services more generally, access to the internet. And that then evolved in 4G into the mobile broadband, where the data rates, the speeds bit per second that we could deliver was high enough so we can use them as a replacement for other types of broadband connectivity. And now, in 2020, uh, 5G was appearing and uh, it starts to be rolled out of the world. We, we have coverage in some parts of Sweden already. And I will talk later about what is the goal with 5G and what that might tell us about the next generation, 6G, which if we are extrapolating here, should appear around year 2030. So when it comes to measuring the quality of a cellular network, there are two main metrics that are important coverage and capacity. So the coverage is the geographical places where you can connect. So here's a map from Telenor who are saying that in most of the places here where they are coloring uh, Sweden, we can use their network. That doesn't mean that the service will be good. Uh, in particular, when it comes to voice services, if you want to make a phone call, then you only need 10 to 100 kilobit per second in order to make a phone call. That is not too much. And if you get more than that, if the network can deliver more than that, the service doesn't get better. But everywhere where you have your graph coverage, you can make a phone call. If it doesn't work, well, then that typically means that you have bars on your phone, but there are too many other people who are trying to access the network at the same time. That is when it doesn't work. And then we come into capacity instead. Capacity is the capability of transferring data when you have coverage. And you can measure it in the number of bits per second per square kilometer that you can deliver your network to the different users. So it's something that you divide between your customers if you own the network. And uh, in addition to make phone calls, I mean, this is something you can uh, discover yourself if you get stuck in a traffic jam in, uh, yeah, in between cities. You might have coverage, but you can st not still use your phone because there are too many people there. You didn't build a network to be able to handle a lot of people in that location, while well, the same thing isn't a problem in Stockholm. Data services that we are using today is very different because if you have more than 100 kilobits, you will be more happy. And typically up to say 100 megabits per second, you will notice that the service runs more smoothly and therefore higher data rate becomes better for you, while voice services more either it works or it doesn't. But it's also most challenging to deliver because it's not everywhere where you have coverage, where you actually have a good enough capacity so that you can use data services. So why do we create new network generations? Well, the basic thing is that the traffic in these networks are increasing. Not the voice traffic, they're increasing with like 1% per year, but according to the Ericsson Mobility Report that I'm showing some graphs on here, in terms of number of exabyte per month that are transferred uh, over different years, we can see that the voice is almost not increasing, but the data traffic is increasing by like 60% per year. So even if we have a technology today that we are satisfied with, we will still need new technologies to sustain this trend because people are using their equipments more and more. 
So when we are designing this new network generation in order to deliver more data to more users, how do we think? Well, the number of bits per square kilometer that we can deliver is given by this basic formula. The number of cells that we're putting out per square kilometer, called the cell density, number of base stations, uh, the available frequency bandwidth, that was the length of one symbol period that was described before. And then the spectral efficiency, that was the logarithm that I described before, measured in bits per second per hertz of bandwidth and per base station. So we basically have these three different factors that we can play around with when we are building future networks. So when it comes to 5G, now we can look back, say 10 years and see what visions did people have and what did it turn into today? And if we are looking back to, for example, 2013, both Qualcomm and Nokia, who are a lot involved in developing the technology, both in terms of base station and in terms of mobile phones, they made a bold prediction that we need to build networks that are capable of delivering a thousand times higher data traffic. And that was based on the uh, idea that, well, if the data traffic will double every year, then two to the power of 10 is, 10, uh, is 1,024. So that is 1,000 times uh, increase over 10 years. Then we saw previously that it might only increase with 60%. And actually in developed countries, it might only increase with 40%. But still uh, having a goal of increasing the data traffic or building a technology capable of it, that is sort of what is leading how we are building the new technologies. And I have a YouTube video that you can find where I've been talking about this before. But uh, apart from companies saying that this is what we would like to do, there were joint efforts uh, uh, like five to 10 years ago in a project called METIS, Europeanly funded, where they set out the goal for 5G to deliver a thousand times higher mobile data volume per area. And that should be achieved by having 10 to 100 times higher typical data rate per user. So when you are active, you should be able to get 10 to 100 times. And we should be able to handle 10 to 100 times more connected devices. And you see, if you multiply 10 with 100 or 100 with 10, you get that thousand. So that makes good sense. But this really asks the question, what kind of data rates do we really need? What should we use them for? So if you think about what are the most demanding applications that you are using today, probably video streaming. So if you're streaming in HD 180p video, you need, according to Netflix, for example, 5 to 10 megabits per second. If you would increase that in the future to 4K, so it's a higher resolution, you might need a 20 to 25 megabits per second. Online gaming typically requires less than this. Uh, you can of course say that, uh, well, in a household, you are many people. So if you multiply this with the number of people in the household, say five or so, then it will go up to uh, 100 megabits or, or more than that. So that is explaining why you need that for your fiber connections. But for every user device, this is typical in numbers. Uh, and even if you look into the future, oh, say that everyone will walk around with some kind of virtual reality glasses with 8K video, 360 degrees, then people who are working on that topic are saying that maybe you need a 50 to 200 megabit per second in order to deliver that to the person. And this is actually something that 4G is already able to deliver. The goals for 4G was from the beginning to deliver in low mobility scenarios, one gigabit per second, so essentially indoors, and in high mobility when you're driving around, maybe 100 megabit per second. So all of these applications could be delivered to uses already today. And this immersive VR isn't even there yet. So the networks are already very capable in order to deliver things to you as a user. The main issue is the traffic growth which is not due to that you as a user need a higher data rate. These are the services that are around. The main thing is that there are more devices around and we are using our devices more often. When we are using them, we still have these data rate requirements, but the more we're using them, the more people there are around that needs to share the total capacity of network. So what we call multiplexing is really the key. That is why we are involved in the network to be able to handle more devices at the same time. So keeping this in mind, what are the conventional multiplexing technologies? Well, there are two main things that have been utilized in the past. So here I will illustrate this with a simple example. Uh, it is the case where we divide the world into four different cells. They're square shaped just to make it simple. 
and you have a base station in the center. And then depending on where you are in this 1000 times 1000 meter area, you will get different data rates in megabits per second. And if you're close to the base station, you have a strong signal, then you get a high data rate. If you're further away, you get a weaker signal and you get interference from the neighboring base stations. So that's why the data rate is dropping. So this is a typical thing that is happening. You also see that the number of bars are changing as you move around and your data rate varies. And one thing that is often happens is that operators try to get hand on more bandwidth. So we had a 5G spectrum auction earlier this year, for example. And suppose we can get 10 times more bandwidth. What will happen then is that if you look at that formula I presented earlier, we have the bandwidth multiplied with the logarithm. That bandwidth becomes 10 times larger. That would mean that the peak values here becomes 10 times larger. So we go from 80 to 800. But it also creates other types of effects that your signals get weaker compared to the noise because you have shorter time intervals. So you have less energy to put in there. And we will come back to exactly to that. But it typically means that this, uh, uh, you get steeper behavior here. So in the center of cells, you get much better performance and other locations you don't. Another option is to deploy more base stations. So here I have two by two, here is eight by eight, so 64 here, here is four. If you put up more base stations, you shorten the distances. So most people are closer to a base station, but you also have the issue that you uh, are getting more interference from the other base stations. So you still have large variations in performance. So, so these are two technologies that are great in order to multiplex more users. Higher data rate, well, you can share it between the users. Uh, more base stations, well, every user will connect to a different one, but they are still providing you with these big variations, which I think is the main problem that we as customers are observing today. It's not the peak rate that is the problem. You can easily stream your Netflix video. The issue is when it lags because you happen to be in the blue cases here where you have bad performance. And the shape of this is determined by that third thing that I mentioned, the spectral efficiency. So let's have a look at how 5G is improving this. The spectral efficiency had to do with this thing that I talked about in the beginning. We divide the sequence or the signal we're transmitting into small intervals with a certain length, which we call the symbol period, which is inversely proportional to the bandwidth. And within each of these ones, we can transmit a certain amount of information. So I was saying that the capacity in bits per second of one transmission is bandwidth, which is the number of these symbol periods per second. And then it's a log of one plus a signal to interference and noise ratio. In the numerator, we have your transmitted power. And then you have the factor at saying how much you're losing on the way. In the denominator, you have the interference that comes from other systems. And then you have your noise power spectral density. This is something that is given by nature. And then you have the bandwidth, which is uh, multiplied with this one to essentially tell how much noise are you actually capturing because this is uh, for just one hertz of bandwidth, and this is what you get. So if you increase the bandwidth, you also get more noise. So let's look at the behavior that I was showing on the previous slide. At different locations, you get different data rates. And if I remove the bandwidth, I can only show this bit per second per hertz spectral efficiency term. In the center of the cell, I have cut it off because typically every standard have a maximum so-called modulation format, which is telling you this is how many bits per second per hertz that we think that people will need. Uh, if we would need a bigger than this, we will need to have hardware of higher quality. And we don't think that we could afford that. So let's limit it to a particular maximum value. So you get that when you're close to the base station and have a very strong signal because the path loss is good. So transmit the signal power times that one is large compared to the other factors. Then as you move away, you have a path loss. The signal is diffusing very quickly with distance. The power disappears typically with the distance to the power of three or four. Uh, so that's why it drops very quickly here. And when, then when you reach the uh, edges of the cell, if the cells are large, it will be the noise that is limiting you. If the cells are small, it might be the interference that is limiting you. So how can we improve something like this? How can we try to even it out so that wherever you are, you will feel that you have a good performance, not only in the center of the cell? Well, if you increase the bandwidth, as I was uh, pointing to earlier, that doesn't help very much if you are at the edges of the cell. Because when you are at the edge of the cell, this signal to interference noise ratio is small. 
the logarithm is almost linear for small inputs. It's something that you might be aware of. So if you take that off, you can see that the bandwidth times this one, if it's a noise that's limiting you, then the bandwidth divided with the bandwidth here, we cancel out each other. That, that's a simple way of saying that having a lot of bandwidth is not helpful at the edge of the cell, only in the center of the cell. But so what can we actually do? Well, we should look at the numerator here and see what can we improve there? We have a factor called the path loss. What can we do with the path loss? Well, the signal is disappearing over distance. So what can we do to combat that? Well, what is conventionally done at base stations is that we say we cannot affect what is happening along the way between the transmitter and receiver, but at least we can do something at transmitter. We can have a very directive transmitter. So that is why you see these tall antennas at the rooftops or in towers, because they are focusing the energy down to the ground where people are and into a particular sector where the user is supposed to be. And if you are a lucky user standing in front of it and you see the base station, well, then you first of all have a good channel because there is nothing blocking you. And then you gain from the directivity because it's focused where you happen to be. So you're lucky. But if you are in other places, for example, blocked by buildings, you have a much worse channel because the channel needs to go through the building or a signal needs to go through the building or it needs to bounce different objects. And all the time you have losses. And you also have no directivity gain in this case here because the signal needs to go in a completely different direction, bounce in this building and make it here. So you are not benefited from this directivity gain. You even are losing from it because you happen to direct the signal to where these two uses weren't. You're not creating more energy, you're just reallocating them. So what we would like to have is at least the possibility to change the directivity depending on where the user is. Just as a flash run, uh, flashlight can be moved around to where you would like to look for the moment. So how can we achieve something like that? Well, we can make use of the physical phenomena of constructive interference. So say that we have two uh, antennas that are radiating signals at the same time. The signals are propagating, the greens are transmitted at the same time, the gray at the same time, the orange at the same time. And you can see that there are certain locations where you will be receiving the signal from these two antennas at the same time. So when they are synchronously, they will add up constructively and create constructive interference. So in these directions, these two antennas will help each other and strengthen each other. So what it essentially means is that both of these antennas are radiating the signal forward with no directivity at all. But when you're looking at these locations here, it will feel like you were having a directive transmission there because in those locations, you will get an addition of the signals in a constructive manner. While in other directions, they will cancel out each other. So you're creating over there this kind of directivity. If you would like the directivity to be different, what you can do is that you can delay the signal at one of the, these places, for example, the right one here. So we see that the green one are transmitted later than this green one or uh, this one at, at a later time than this one. And now the locations where you have them adding up constructively is in the different directions. So now you have essentially created their activity in a different direction. So this is the way of creating adapted directivity. And it can not only be utilized to transmit signals strongly towards a particular location where users happen to be, we can also use it for multiplexing. And then we are, have something called multiple input, multiple output, namely that we have multiple transmitting antennas, we have multiple users. And instead of transmitting one strong beam in this direction, we are cutting the power between them. We still have the same directivity, but we are dividing the power between these two users, sending at the same time, at the same frequency, signals in different directions. And now we're able to handle two use at the same time. We can divide the power even further and serve four use at the same time. And in this way, you can evolve the traffic capacity in your cell. And this is really what is going on between 4G and 5G. So we have been going from mainly having passive antennas with a fixed directivity, we are guessing where the user is supposed to be, to the case where we have arrays with many small antennas. Each of them have not much of their activity, but together they can be operated to create signals that are so-called beam formed, uh, focused with constructive interference towards the location of users. And then we can also spatially multiplex, multiplex multiple use at the same time as the, you uh, are getting more traffic in your network. And this is, by the way, called massive MIMO. And this is something that will be mentioned more in this presentation. 
So just to sum up, what are the main benefits of having antenna arrays in 5G? Well, uh, the first thing is this adaptivity uh, in terms of beamforming. We don't have a fixed directivity. We can steer it around depending on where the user is. So if I was before showing something like this, uh, where you have a good service in the center of the cell and then worse when you are at the other locations. Now, particularly at the edges of cell, we can raise the performance. You are focusing the signal to where the user is, there is still interference, there is still noise, but it doesn't grow in the same way because that interference is not direct to where you are at average. So you're improving the performance for most users, but you still have large variations. And the second uh, option, in, the, in addition to this more consistent performance that you can get in your cell, is the multiplexing. One user maybe had to be served at a time before. So if you can deliver a huge data rate, you have to cut it between your users. And then you hope that the piece that the user were getting still was good enough for the service that they were asking for. Now, it is more like the, you take the cake that the user would get if it was alone in cell. And then when you add more users into the system, you're growing the cake. So everyone gets a slice of the cake, but the slice is equally large as the entire cake was before, because we can serve different users located in different directions at the same time. So technology is improving the traffic capacity as the uh, traffic is growing, then the cave becomes larger. So have 5G reached these goals that were set out before of a thousand times more data traffic? Well, first of all, they were saying that we will double the data traffic. Uh, that was their prediction, but actually didn't happen. Uh, it was more like 45% growth. Uh, so uh, you will only see a 40 times uh, 42 times growth over 10 years. So 1,000 times is really just taking a too big number. But we will continue to see this kind of traffic growth. And if you see here, from once again, from the Ericsson Mobility Report, in 2020, we can see the first addition in the number of exabytes per month that are delivered in wireless networks over the world. That comes from 5G. So the yellow part here is with 4G, 3G, and 2G. And then with time, the prediction is that 5G will deliver a larger and larger fraction of the traffic in the world. And in five years time, it might all, almost be uh, half of the, the traffic that is uh, going through these type of networks. And of course, we see this continued exponential growth rate with like 45% per year. So really need the technology, but the future will tell if the technology can actually sustain this trend or not, because we are building a technology now that isn't having the capacity. Capacity is not like a resource that you can divide uh, in whatever way you like. The capacity is created, the growth in capacity is created as you add more use into network, because then you can serve more use at the same time. Uh, if they're not there, not requesting it, then you don't have the capacity. Okay, so I talked a lot about mobile broadband. I can just briefly touch upon all the other things that might be of interest when it comes to digitalization of society. So high data rates for mobile broadband is important in the cases where you're going to transmit a lot of data. For example, video streaming. You're not that concerned with reliability because you can always retransmit small packets if it gets lost. That is what you're used to on the internet anyway. And the latest isn't a big problem either because you can always buffer things in your phone. Um, but if you have other types of applications, critical applications, say that you have different vehicles are going to communicate with each other, it's very important to have high reliability and low latency. Well, what you can do is that if you build a network that have the capability of delivering high data rates, you can choose to not be so efficient and still get decent data rate. And if you need higher reliability, well, you can trade away data rate for that by retransmitting or sending the same thing twice. You're repeating a message multiple times in the hope that it will at least one of those times come over. So that kind of redundancy is lowering data rate, but increase reliability. And the high data rate is also achieved when you're transmitting long actual data using so-called channel codes to deal with that. And if you need lower latency, you need to use shorter channel codes that are not as efficient. So you're once again, trading away data. Rate. And for Internet of Things devices that are not going to transmit a lot of data, just a small measurement now and then, you don't need high data range. You need long battery life. And then you can also trade away these features and build something that is less efficient in terms of transmitting a lot of data, but more efficient in terms of energy efficiency. 
So it's still the key to everything to have a system able of delivering high data rates. And one could also think about that maybe high data rates, everyone is using their phones today, everyone is paying multi subscription. If we should eventually pay for a new 5G technology, then it might be these two different new technology types that will create new revenue streams that will be uh, paying for the evolution of the wireless technology. So with that, let's now finally go into and talk about six divisions and what might be enabling technology in this direction. And I would like to start with this uh, uh, quote from Ray, Roy Amara, who says that we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. And I think this also goes back to what I was mentioning, 1000 times increase with 5G. Well, it will probably not happen. It will probably just be 40, 50 times more increase. But over time, if we build a technology that is capable of delivering a thousand times more, we, that will change things. And another example, I digged out an, a report from OECD 2004, which was in the middle of the 3G era. And they were talking about in this report, what will 3G be used for? And they were saying that, oh, if we use for video calling, location-based services, mobile broadband in, for access of internet and video services. And yes, we are using all these things today, but video calling, it didn't take off until FaceTime. 2010, and now during the pandemic, it has been used a lot. And uh, access in the network uh, or the internet in your phone, well, 3G was capable of it, but it didn't really take off until the iPhone 3G or even the, the later iPhones uh, appeared towards the end of the 3G era and the beginning of the 4G era. So things that we believe to happen often happens later. And this is also in line with what Roy Amara is saying here. So I think this is important when it comes to thinking about what should 6G do? Well, we shouldn't think about what are the applications that will appear later, because the application that we predicted for 5G, uh, mobile broadband, but also like critical uh, um, uh, services like self-driving cars or low power devices for Internet of Things, they haven't really taken off yet. We don't know how capable 5G is going to be. And therefore we cannot really predict what will come after that. So we shouldn't stretch to speculate too much about the application right now, but build new technologies that are good, good at things that is important for using wireless technology. And then when we have built that, new application will arise. It might be the things that people are predicting today, like virtuality, augmented reality. It might be the same applications as in 5G that will be important in the 6G era as well, or it might be other things. But as long as we build a good technology, it will be utilized and new services will be added on top of that. So I think the 6G research focus that is starting now in the wireless communication area should focus on evolving technology, not thinking too much about applications and think more about what can be improved by 10 times and how. And I will provide you with three different examples that I think are interesting uh, very briefly, from something I call cell-free networks, something I call reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, and something I call physically large arrays. So I have one slide for each of them. So cell-free networks is something that is meant for having a more consistent data rate. So that was something I was pointing out all the time where we have these large variations in data rate depending on if you're in the center of the cell or if you're further away. And even with massive MIMO where you can direct the signal to where the user is, you still have these variations. You can, you're not changing the path loss, you're only directing the signal more to where the user is and the path loss can be huge in wireless. So if you compare a conventional setup with four cells, say you have a massive MIMO base station with 110 elements at each base station. This is typical in 5G. And you compare this by saying, okay, we, here we have four times 100, that's 400 antennas. Let us spread out those antennas over the coverage area instead. Connect them all together to a cloud computer who is controlling them. And let's now see as I'm moving around as a user here, what spectral efficiency in bits per second per hertz can I get as a user? And this is what I'm showing here. This is a cumulative distribution function, which is saying that if I'm moving around randomly network, these are the variations I will see from bad to good uh, bits per second. And if I consider this network here, we, you will have good data rates when you're close to base station, you will have bad data rate when you're far away. 
if you are spreading out the antennas, but every one of them is creating their own cell, and then they start to interfere with each other, you get the red curve here, which is essentially the same. So as you move around, the service quality won't feel different. There will be different places where you have a good service or bad service, but the variations are the same. But if you spread out the antennas and then you control them with a cloud computer that is making them all work as if it was an array on one location, but they're distributed. Well, then you will change the way that wireless networks are delivered. Instead of having base stations at given locations surrounded by users that are asking for service, you as a user will be somewhere here, you will be surrounded by antennas that are cooperating to serve you, sending signals from all directions towards you, and that will create the move consistent performance. So in my new book on this topic, uh, this is something we call cell-free massive MIMO networks, we could um, uh, show, for example, that you can at least deliver four times better performance in the worst cases by doing stuff like this. And we also have a concept together with Ericsson called Ericsson Radio Stripes, where the idea is that uh, we could deploy this by putting many antennas together with a fiber cable and uh, with uh, the power supply and everything in the form factor of a cable, because cables could be put up anywhere on uh, walls outside, for example, and people are not noticing them. And in that way, we could, in an affordable way, put up a lot of antennas and also provide them with the power supply and the back wall and everything that's needed. The second thing is that we will, even if we put up antennas, we will figure out that there are coverage hole, places where there are buildings around or someone parked a car somewhere that's blocking the signal or stuff like that. And those coverage holes, we can never densify our network to get rid of them. But what if we could change something in the propagation environment to help us? I mean, you cannot move around the building, but can we electronically move something? Well, this is what a reconfigurable intelligent surface is doing. This is a surface that can take a signal that comes from a base station, makes it through the window here, and it reaches this wall, and instead of being reflected according to Snell's law in physics towards the right part of the room here, we would like it to be collected, the radio energy, and then beam formed towards me here with my iPad. And the way of building something like this is to build an array of small passive elements. Each one of them will reflect the signal. And the way that it reflects the signal is determined by something called the reflection coefficient which is determined by physical properties, such as the impedance of the elements. And by creating a surface that is unnatural in the way that every element is connected to some kind of switch that is changing its impedance values, we can create a variations. It's like we are changing the structure of the wall uh, such that the signal gets reflected, not towards the right part of the room, but in the direction that we like. So by controlling every element and not adding radio energy to it, but only changing its physical properties in terms of impedances, we can change how radio waves are bouncing off elements. And this can be used to control propagation environment to some extent and remove coverage holes. Finally, I was talking a lot about that the main thing with wireless is to be able to serve many users. And we can densify, we can have more frequency spectrum, but we can also use antennas for it. And that is what 5G is really about. And still, even if we call the new technology in 5G massive MIMO, massive is meaning that we have 100 antennas that we can control instead of one as before. But it's still not massive in size. It's still something that you can put on a rooftop and it would look small from a distance. The signal will be coming from one small direction towards you. But what if we would put out the antennas distributed over the entire face of the building here? We can create something that's physically large. And in that case, we can actually put out, say, 100,000 or 10,000 different small antenna elements here. Each of them are transmitting with a very small amount of energy, but together they can do nice things. For example, just as our two eyes can see, they get a depth perception for seeing the distance of things. When you have a big array compared to the distance to the user, you can focus signals like a lens at one location instead of one direction. This allows you to do some kind of extreme multiplex of users. Everyone have a small reading around them where the signal to them will be strong, and then you can serve an added one, you stand next to you, and so on. We wrote a paper some years ago where we we're saying that suppose you would deploy uh, around uh, Central Park in New York, a lot of antennas on the skyscrapers there, focused towards Central Park. 
And then you, you know that the, it's from time to time they have big concerts there with uh, hundreds of thousands of people there. Well, you can actually, with 100,000 antennas, serve, say, uh, 20,000 users, and they will then share one terabit per second, 1,000 gigabit per second, or 1 million megabit per second. That you divide between them. And this is using the type of spectrum that operates already have today. They don't need to go find new spectrum. They can just deploy new infrastructure in order to deliver this. So to sum things up, how can then mobile broadband be evolved beyond 5G? Well, I think there are two dimensions that are important. One thing is the number of antennas, and one thing is uh, where we are using frequency spectrum. And conventional networks are being deployed in the frequency spectrum from 600 megahertz up to maybe 5 gigahertz or so. That is where 5G is being deployed now as well. And traditionally, they have been used using passive antennas. With 5G, we are evolving. We are being able to use this massive arrays that can direct signals to different users at different locations. So we can multiplex use in that domain. This technology is also supporting something called millimeter wave, higher frequency bands than before where we can find new frequency spectrum. Why? Well, to get higher data rates, not because a particular user needs it, but because we can divide it between the users. And so far that this has not taken off. It is still the three gigahertz bands that are being utilized in 5G. And I think it will be the dominant thing uh, throughout 5G. And it will only be in like Wi-Fi like situations where this type of technology will be utilized. But still since 5G, have a new feature, namely that you can use frequency spectrum that are very different than before, higher up in the frequency range, where the, the range is shorter, but you have more spectrum. Some researchers are saying that we will, we will continue moving along this axis here, going up in higher frequency to find more bandwidth. But the only thing we need more bandwidth for is to multiplex more users. And we can multiplex more users using the frequency bands that we already have by using more antennas. So that is why I believe much more in that type of evolution, having more antennas in the frequency bands of before and to some extent in the new 5G bands millimeter wave. And they can be used to, for extreme spatial multiplexing using physical large array, get more uniform service quality by spreading out the antennas and control them jointly. And you can use reconfigurable intelligent surfaces to improve the coverage holes. So if you would like to hear me talk more about all these kind of things. I have a YouTube channel with the 13,000 subscribers. I have a podcast, I have a blog, all of them called Wireless Future. So please have a look at that one if you're interested. Uh, there's also a white paper for me and a lot of other people on broadband connectivity in 60 that you can download from this address. And with that, I guess it's time to answer questions.